All right. Are we good? We're good. Moving on. We're trudging forward. Okay, let's go back to our case. We got our lady. She comes in. She just ain't right. Our vital signs are no bueno. What is this telling us about our circulation? Is our circulation intact or is our circulation not intact? Not intact. Can you think about some things that you would want to know now that you didn't know just a few moments ago? What are some things that you are now thinking about and some bits of information that you would want that you wouldn't have thought about when I initially asked you this? Help me out. What are some things? What's her map? Wonderful. What else? What's her capillary refill time? I love it. It makes my heart happy when I hear somebody say that. What else? What's her CVO2? And what goes along with CVO2? Starts with an L, ends with an actate. Lactate. Good. Whoever said that? Right? All of a sudden, we're building upon this conceptual framework. We're not just looking at a set of vitals and shouting out a differential, right? We're beginning to think about the hemodynamics and the macro the micro circulation. This is her chest x-ray. Apparently, she thins up whenever she has to take a big deep breath for a chest x-ray. What do you think? Good? Not so good. Looks good, right? Looks clear. From here on out, just as, a, as an aside, don't spend too much time fixating on chest x-rays. Chest x-rays are a qualitative screening test for the lungs, right? Ultrasound and CT scan are exponentially better. When you're looking at a chest x-ray, you are asking yourself, do I see something or do I not see something? And if you do see something in the lungs, it's only one of two patterns. It's either airspace disease or interstitial disease. Okay, you can make it really, really simple. But we don't see anything, right? Our screening test is negative. Chest x-ray looks relatively clear. Is she in shock? She is in shock, right? Even if her map isn't less than 65, she's got a positive shock index. She's not making a whole lot of sense. She's not getting perfusion to her brain. Let's talk about shock. I couldn't believe I found this. I always say that shock is the final train stop before death. It is the most deadly thing that we take care of in the hospital. Now, I have never seen this movie, but I promise you it is on my 2C list now, death train. Shock is the death train. It has the highest mortality of anything that you will take care of, so you need to be thinking about it all the time. All the time you need to be thinking about shock. Is this person in shock? Is this person in shock? They look okay, but they might still be in shock, right? So we're constantly thinking about what is shock. Shock is the last stop before death. So you must know exactly what to do to prevent that from happening. That's why we're all here, right? To save lives. So how are we going to define shock? I think we define shock in terms of the hemodynamics and or the microcirculation. So from a hemodynamic perspective, from a big picture, thousand, view, thousand foot view perspective, shock is hypotension, which we really care about MAP because that's our organ perfusion. So it's a MAP less than 65 leading to organ failure. And the reason that we have to include that organ failure part is that some people just live with a MAP that's lower, right? Not every human being needs a MAP over 65, but the vast majority do. So shock, we can say, is a MAP less than 65 and organ failure, or it's inadequate oxygen delivery relative to oxygen consumption, leading to a lactate elevation. And we use a number over four, right? If you've got a lactate over four, there's probably badness, and that leads to organ failure. And we call that shock without overt hypotension. Or you may have heard this called cryptic shock or occult shock. It's shock. Our framework for shock, for identifying the source of shock, is going to be tank, pump, and the pipes. Tank, pump, and pipes. When we see shock, when we think shock, when we smell shock, or when we intuit shock, 
we immediately think tank, pump, and the pipes. And ideally, we want to figure out exactly what is causing the shock. But I will tell you that a lot of the time you cannot and you will not. So I want you to begin preparing yourself for being comfortable with uncertainty, right? We are going to be zen, right? We are going to be aggressively zen about shock. Right? So when we are thinking, smelling, seeing shock, we are okay if we don't know the exact cause of it because we will still know exactly what to do with it. So take a big, deep breath. Exhale it slowly. It is okay if you say undifferentiated shock because I still know exactly what to do with it. Okay? You will not know the cause of shock. And that doesn't mean that you're a bad doctor. Tank failure. We said that our tank is our, fl our fluid and our hemoglobin. So what causes tank failure is either loss of fluid or loss of hemoglobin. And what causes loss of fluid? Vomiting and diarrhea, third space losses, and insensible losses. So somebody who's crawling through the desert, hasn't had... Uh, water for days. I don't think we see that very often here in Chattanooga, but we do see people who are uh, outside for inappropriate, uh, inappropriate periods of time or don't have adequate access to water. So it's fluid loss, not subtle fluid loss, right? This is like a lot of fluid loss. This is like they got a GI, GI bug and it is firing out of both ends, right? Or hemorrhage. Luckily, there's only a few places that you can lose blood, right? There's only a few places that you can lose blood, and they will show you, right? They will show you where they are losing blood from. And if they are anemic and in shock, and they're not showing you blood, then it's retroperitoneal. GI bleed, retroperitoneal bleed, trauma, or hemolysis. How about pump failure? This is the complicated one. This is the one that can be difficult to pick up. Because pump failure can either be cardiogenic or it can be obstructive. Obstructive is the, is the like stepchild that's always forgotten about, right? Somebody comes in in shock, and the first question we ask ourselves is, it's either cardiogenic or septic, right? That's probably what you saw your residents and attendings thinking about, right? But I want the first thing that you think about to be obstructive. Why? Because I can do something about it. We can do something about it immediately and reverse the train or halt the train head into death town. So I really think about cardiogenic shock as being one of three potential causes. Either it's rate rhythm related. The heart rate's too slow, the heart rate's too fast, and it's irregular. It could be a contractility issue, but you have to remember that pump is two-sided. So it could be right-sided failure or left-sided failure, or it could be valve, and the two valves where all the money is at for hemodynamic instability is the mitral big time and then the aortic. The tricuspid, the pulmonic, nah, we don't worry about those too much. And then obstructive shock, the big three, PE, pneumothorax, and tamponade. And when somebody's in cardiac arrest, those are the three that you're thinking about, PE, pneumothorax, tamponade. We can figure all of those out like that with point-of-care ultrasound. And I would personally argue that when it comes to cardiac arrest or any shock state, this is the first thing that we're looking for. I, I don't, my fingers aren't good for picking up a pulse, so I believe in POCUS checks. POCUS checks. We don't do pulse checks. We have other things that can tell us there's a pulse, and tidal CO2, change in rhythm. What I really want to know is what's around the heart or what does the heart look like? And finally, pipe failure, classically called distributive shock. I like vasoplegic shock better. It just tells you exactly what's going on, right? Those pipes are floppy. They don't have that tone to propagate that bolus of blood to the metabolizing tissue. And these are the big five, six. I can't believe I put six. As you will come to know about me, there are five causes, five steps, five treatments for everything in medicine. But there, I put six things up there. The big common six causes of vasoplegic shock are sepsis, adrenals, anaphylaxis, pancreatitis. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you make a mistake by putting pancreatitis up there? Isn't pancreatitis hypovolemic shock and you give them loads and loads and loads and liters and liters of liters of fluid? Uh-uh, we don't, right? 
post-op, anybody who goes to the operating room can come back with some degree of vasoplegia. It doesn't mean that they went to the operating room and they got a ventilator-associated pneumonia, right? Go into the operating room, the exposure to the anesthetic agents, the sedative agents, surgery itself can all cause post-op vasoplegia. Post-cardiac surgery being the biggest um, culprit of this, the more foreign material that your body is exposed to, the more likely you are to develop vasoplegia. This is why if you put somebody on an ECMO circuit, they will almost always look like they're getting septic. This is why almost every patient who comes out of the OR from cardiac surgery looks septic. And then finally, cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a chronic state of vasoplegia. If you'll notice, the classic cirrhotic blood pressure is like 80 over 50. They've lost that ability to vasoconstrict their splanchnic circulation, among other things, not clearing uh, vasodilatory mediators, et cetera but I don't want you to just memorize another list. If I was just standing up here and I taught you a list, I would be wasting your time. Because when somebody is dying in front of you and seconds matter and you need to make a decision, you cannot think of a list. I can't. I can't think about H's and T's in a cardiac arrest, right? I may appear stoic, but I'm about to have a code brown, right? Trying to make certain that I, that I, that I uh, think about all the potential reversible causes. So we're going to use the way the tank, the pump, and the pipes compensate to help us narrow in and figure out what's causing that shock. When one of these goes down, the others will, com you like that animation? The others will compensate in very predictable ways. The pump, I'm sorry, the tank, if the pump, or the pipes go down, what the tank will do is constrict. Your venous circulation will tense and send that reserve blood to the arterial circulation. It plays its part. How do we pick this up? With point of care ultrasound and looking at the IVC. We know that looking at the IVC is not, a good, is, not, is not useful to determine whether or not the person is hypovolemic. When you see a flat IVC, intra, you guys know what I'm talking about, IVC? Please raise your hand if, if you don't. When you see a flat IVC, that's not because you're completely dry and hypovolemic. It's because the venous circulation is constricting in an attempt to increase the fluid to the heart. So that's what we're going to think of from now on when we see a flat or dynamic IVC is tank compensation. Does that make sense? Pump compensation. This one's a little bit more straightforward. If the tank is empty of fluid or blood or the pipes have lost their tone, the pump will go into overdrive. It'll be harder, inotropy. It'll be faster, chronotropy. And how does this manifest? This manifests as tachycardia. Manifests as tachycardia, heart rate that's fast. What do we see on point of care ultrasound? A hyperdynamic heart. Ventricles that are slapping together. It looks like they're clapping. But we see a lot of patients with heart failure. We see a lot of patients with hypertension who are on beta blockers. So one of the first medicines that I'm always looking for is, is this person on a beta blocker? Because this will blunt your ability to recognize pump compensation. This is why people who are on beta blockers who get super sick can get even sicker because they don't have the ability for the heart to comp, for the pump to compensate as it normally would. Pipes compensation. How does the arterial and capillary network compensate if the, if the tank is empty of fluid or blood or the pump is not squeezing well? They clamp. They will increase the tone. They will increase the resistance. This manifests as cool extremities, a cool forearm. If you're cool, you have increased SVR tone. So you know if somebody's cold, that their arterial and capillary network is still intact. 
This is unlikely to be a vasoplegic problem because that reflex is still there. Usually on vital signs, you'll see a preserved diastolic pressure, right? Because the diastolic blood pressure is a surrogate for arterial tone. Cool extremities, delayed capillary refill. See how helpful this is? We can use these surrogates on physical exam and ultrasound to know what's compensating to lead us to what's failed. Now we don't have to be able to pick out exactly what's wrong because now we also have clues to help us figure out what might be wrong. So let's sum this all up. If we have tank failure, the profile looks something like this. Thinking about the big thousand foot view hemodynamic picture. Your heart rate's gonna be fast and you'll probably have a positive shock index unless they're on a beta blocker. Your blood pressure, you're probably gonna have a preserved diastolic blood pressure, meaning it's gonna be over 50. And your pulse pressure is gonna be narrow. On exam, they're going to be cool because your pipes are still intact. Their point of care ultrasound, their LV is going to be beating either normally or really hard, and their IVC is going to be collapsed. In the microcirculation, our CVO2 is going to be low, our lactate is going to be high, and our capillary refill is going to be delayed. Even if we can't see the IVC, we have so many other clues to there being a tank failure problem. Let's practice a bit, shall we? Shall we? I was hoping we could. Nope, nothing. Okay. So what this was going to show is an IVC that was completely flat. I wanted you to be able to see what a flat IVC looked like, but technical difficulties. This is a hyperdynamic left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. This is the left atria. This is the aorta. This is a parasternal long axis view. If you don't know any of that, that's okay. I don't expect you to. You will learn. But even your mother, if you showed her these pictures, could tell you that those walls are slapping together and they should not. That is not normal. That is a hyperdynamic left ventricle. Pump failure profile. What are we going to see? We're going to see tachycardia, probably a positive shock index, unless... Beta walkers, okay, we're going to see a preserved diastolic blood pressure because the pipes are still intact with a narrow pulse pressure. Our CVP, rather than being low, is going to be high. A high CVP is never something to shoot for. A high CVP is always telling you that there is a problem with the pump. Exam or extremities, our forearm is going to be cold or cool. And on point of care ultrasound, we may see a lot of different possibilities. We may see poor function of the left ventricle. We may see poor function of the right ventricle. We should see an IVC that's dilated because of high cardiac filling pressure. We may see tamponade. What are we going to see with our microcirculation? Low CVO2, high lactate, and delayed capillary refill. Here's a couple pictures. Parasternal long axis view. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. What do you notice about that left ventricle? It's dilated. It's not squeezing well. See how easy it is to just look at that and go, ah, that doesn't look right. It's pretty easy, right? And that's all we're ever going to ask you to do. We're never going to ask you to calculate anything complex or do super, super advanced echocardiography. It's just eyeballing it. 
is, it, is the LV function low, normal, or high? This is called an apical four-chamber view. The problem with an apical four-chamber view is that everything's completely whited out. This is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. What do you notice? The right ventricle is bigger than the left ventricle. Guess what? The right ventricle should never be bigger than the left ventricle. The left ventricle is like Schwarzenegger. And the right ventricle is like, I don't know, Leonard Nimoy or something. It's like thin, but it's super smart. And the left ventricle is big and beefy and gets all of the props and the credit. But, you know, if you really had to choose the person that you wanted to hang out and get a beer with, it'd probably be the more thoughtful, thinner, frail one, right? Maybe. I don't know. Um, anyway, this is your right ventricle should never be the same size as your left. And it should certainly never be bigger. This is the type of RV dysfunction we want you to be able to pick out. Big, glaring, and obvious. This is a sub-xiphoid view, or it could be, depending on what this decides to do. I promise you, I check these videos 50,000 times. Uh, this is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. This is the left atria. And what is that? That's fluid around the ventricle. And what this video is going to show is a, what looks like a little person, man or woman or anyone, jumping on a trampoline. That's how you know there's tamponade. You see fluid around there, and it looks like there's somebody jumping on the trampoline because their heart can't fill, right? Diastolic collapse of the right ventricular free wall. No luck. And here is blankness again. Uh, here is a dilated IVC. Ideally, when we measure it, here's the heart. Here's the IVC. Here's a hepatic vein. We measure the IVC just distal to that. Look at how big and dilated it is. And if the video sh played, you would see that it doesn't vary at all. All right, and finally, the pipes failure profile. The hemodynamics, the heart rate should be fast because the pump is still intact. And you may have a positive shock index. Here's the difference between the other two. The pipes aren't intact, so you have a low diastolic pressure. And your pulse pressure is wide. The CVP is going to be variable. It may be really low. It may be normal. It may be intermediate. Or sometimes it can even be high. Because up to 30% of patients with pipe failure or vasoplegic shock can develop stress cardiomyopathy. Ugh, complicated, right? Our extremities are warm. So when you feel warm extremities and you see a low blood pressure, you know that there's a problem with the pipes because they should be cold. On point-of-care ultrasound, it's really variable. You'll probably see an LV that's normal to hyperdynamic, an IVC that's collapsing or flat. And in the microcirculation, you'll see variable CO CVO2, usually a high lactate, and variable capillary refill time. Because remember, it's not a pipe problem. I'm sorry, it's not a pump or a tank problem. It's a pipe problem. All right, let's pause for just a moment. That was a lot. That was a lot to digest. And if I was hearing that for the first time, I would feel overwhelmed. So if you feel overwhelmed, if you're starting to feel like, holy shit, I'm never going to be able to do this, that's completely normal. I'm with you. I would feel that way too. I still feel that way most mornings when I walk into the ICU. Oh my gosh, everybody's going to figure out that I don't really know what I'm doing. It's called imposter syndrome in almost all of us, or anybody who's thoughtful has it. If you don't have imposter syndrome, You might be a sociopath. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But it's completely normal. So if you're sitting here feeling overwhelmed, that is completely normal. You will know how to do this. This is attainable. This is hopefully as simple as you will see in just a moment where we cover shock resuscitation in five steps. So long as you can remember and keep in mind, am I doing okay on time? As long as you can remember and keep in mind that we use the hemodynamics, the tank, the pump, and the pipes, and the compensation that they will have for one another to identify the shock profile, 
you'll always know what to do, even if you don't know why it's failing. Even if you know, you can now identify, all right, I know the pump's failing, but I don't know why and I don't know what to do about it. You still know what to do about it. Even if the pipes are failed and this is septic shock and you're going, I don't know what to do for septic shock. After this next few slides, you will. So relax. If you're feeling overwhelmed, that's completely normal. It's going to feel a whole lot simpler in just a moment. But what's important is that these lectures are building upon each other. That you're beginning to understand the circulation. You're beginning to understand how the circulation fails. Now you're going to see what we do about that failed circulation. Is that a, re is that a reasonable roadmap? You with me? Don't shake your head if you're not with me. Because everybody's shaking their head. All right. We move forward. Shock resuscitation in five steps. Step one. Every person that you think, see, smell, intuit shock, you support their work of breathing. You address the oxygenation and ventilation. You target an oxygen saturation over 90%. We aim for 90 to 95% in every ICU patient. You normalize the work of breathing. What's that? Nasal cannula, it's worthless. It's completely worthless. Don't use it in shock. Your goal isn't to just make the oxygen look better. Your goal is to normalize the work of breathing. Because what did we say that work of breathing mimics? High work of breathing is exercise. And what does exercise do to your oxygen consumption? It goes up. Fascinating little tidbit. As we all sit here, what percentage of your cardiac output would you guess is devoted to your work of breathing? Yeah, low. Give me a number. Throw out a number. 15. You're completely wrong. No, I'm just kidding. 15. That's a great guess. That's a great guess, but it's lower. It's even lower than 5%. Only about 1% to 3% of your cardiac output is devoted to your work of breathing. Something that you do consciously and unconsciously all day, every day of your life, only 1% to 3% of your cardiac output goes to support that process. But if you're exercising, i.e. you're in shock, do you know what that number can go up to? Yes. Not all at once, though. 80. Jeez. 30%. 30. Your liver and your kidneys and your skin and your intestines, that's a lot of your cardiac output going to support the work of breathing. So how do we support the work of breathing? You have one of two options. High flow or high velocity nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation. Oops. Here, our version of high flow nasal cannula is Vapotherm. And it's technically called high velocity nasal cannula, but whatever. Vapotherm can provide flows of up to 40 liters a minute. As you will learn in respiratory failure, right now this is meaningless to you, but as you will learn this afternoon, this will actually decrease your dead space, making every single breath more efficacious at exchanging gas, at exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. It can provide oxygen up to 100%, and it also provides humidity. And that humidity can improve secretion clearance, which is especially important if you've got a respiratory lung pathology. And it can actually also decrease your free water losses that goes up when you have a high work of breathing. How about non-invasive ventilation, which is either CPAP or BPAP? It's not technically BiPAP. BiPAP is a trade name like Kleenex. So it's either CPAP or BPAP. What non-invasive ventilation does is it provides positive airway pressure. It opens up recruitable or collapsed or partially collapsed alveoli and also helps improve gas exchange. There are advantages and disadvantages to non-invasive ventilation. 
We know that non-invasive ventilation will both decrease the need for intubation and decrease mortality in acute exacerbations of COPD. And we know that it'll decrease the need for intubation and heart failure exacerbations. Doesn't necessarily save lives in that case, though. The disadvantages of non-invasive ventilation, however, is that it decreases your preload. All positive pressure ventilation prevents blood from getting to the venous circulation to the right side of the heart. And if you're in shock, that can be really, really bad. So non-invasive ventilation can drop your blood pressure even more. The other disadvantage is you put a mask on them. If you are struggling to breathe because you're in shock, if you are in shock, you will be working hard to breathe. Can you imagine if somebody put a tight-fitting mask over you? Feels like you're in this mini wind tunnel. It's going to be uncomfortable, and they're going to scramble to take it off. And then you're wrestling with the idea of, oh, gosh, do I sedate them or tube them? And the final issue, and I would argue one of the biggest, because I can compensate for the decrease in preload, is that people who are in shock have very high work of breathing. They're exercising continuously. They want huge breaths. And when you're providing positive pressure, what's the problem with huge breaths? It damages the lungs. My preference is high-flow nasal cannula for everybody in shock, even if they have a normal oxygen saturation, because it decreases the work of breathing. And sometimes you have to use non-invasive ventilation, but I really think that high-flow is the way to go. You like that? Step one, support the work of breathing. Get the SAT over 90%, make the work of breathing better. If they're breathing 30 times a minute, I want them breathing normal. Step two, find the source. We have three things that we're going to use to find the source. Is this tank failure? Is this pump failure? Is this pipe failure? We have our vital signs. We have whether they're hot or cold. And we have our Philips point of care ultrasound. I have a love affair with point of care ultrasound. I think Dr. Cohen does as well. It creates this really weird triangular thing of jealousy. We want you to love point of care ultrasound as well. So let's think about our vitals again. If our MAP is less than 65, our heart rate should be fast. We want it to be between 90 and 130. Too fast, that's a little faster than that, maybe a little too fast, especially if they have diastolic dysfunction and the heart already struggles to fill. Diastolic pressure, if it's over 50, if it's preserved, you're thinking that this is tank or pump failure. And if it's low, you're thinking this is pipe failure. Pulse pressure, if it's narrow, meaning less than 40, you think tump, t eh, tank or pump failure. If it's normal or wide, that should say 40, you think pipe failure. And CVP, if it's low, you think tank failure. If it's high, you think pump failure. And if it's in between, ugh, I don't know. But vital signs are hemodynamic assessment. ultrasound a quick shout out thank you so much dr cohen for allowing me to take this picture he really does a marvelous job manscaping doesn't he ladies and gentlemen <laughs> um point of care ultrasound we put it on the chest we rule out pneumothorax we rule out tamponade and we look at the rv to say is this massive pe or not and then we get a general idea of the cardiac function is it low is it normal is it hyperdynamic and then we look at the ivc that's what we're doing for all of our shock patients, just asking those three questions. So, vital signs to find the source. Now, all you need, you've got the vital signs figured out. You know how to touch somebody's forearm and figure out if they're warm or cold. Now, you just got to get kind of facile with the ultrasound. And until you do that, I'm going to still give you a way to manage shock. But that's it. Those are the only three things you need to identify the source. But only if you go back and review and recall how we use our vital signs, 
our physical exam and point of care ultrasound to figure out shock based on our direct signs and our compensation. Step number three, we're going to resuscitate the hemodynamics. In other words, we're going to get the map over 65. Step number one, we support the work of breathing. Step number two, we find the source. And step number three, we get the map over 65. There's only three things to do this. Fluid, blood, and vasopressors. To get the map over 65, we only have three tools in our arsenal. Fluid, blood, and vasopressors. Fluid. During our hemodynamic resuscitation, we use a fluid bolus. During somebody's hospitalization, their entire hospitalization, they will only get one fluid bolus. One. That's it. They never get another fluid bolus again. We're giving that fluid bolus to fill the tank. How much? What does it mean to fill the tank? I don't know. We say 30 cc's per kilo, right? Do you know where that number came from? It came from here, thin air. There's nothing magical about the number 30 cc's per kilo. But it probably makes some degree of sense when you give a fluid bolus to give some weight-based amount. Now, our patient population tends to have quite a bit of urban body armor. I don't know if that fluid bolus is, should be based on ideal weight, predicted weight, actual weight. Nobody does. So I say a fluid bolus is two or three liters. I never give more than that. Two or three liters max. Your bolus is two to three liters. And what sort of solution are we going to give? Balanced solution. I put balanced in, quest in quotation marks because it's not really that balanced. But our balance solution is going to be lactated ringers, and we avoid saline like the plague unless there's a neurocatastrophe or hypochloremia, which we so rarely see. So if we only have three things to resuscitate the hemodynamics, we're going to use them liberally unless there's a contraindication. Oh, sorry. Here's the composition of fluids. I want you to look right here. That is the pH of normal saline. That is remarkably low, is it not? Why, oh why, would we pound somebody with an acidemic solution who's already acidemic because of their underlying physiology? That's not really that much better. That's still not physiologic, but that's the best we've got here. This is why we don't use saline. One last word about fluids. Somebody gets one fluid bolus and one fluid bolus only throughout their entire hospitalization. I don't know what one liter of fluid really means. If they need fluids, they get a fluid bolus to fix their tank, to fill their tank. I have never in my entire career, and my entire career as an attending has been taking care of the sickest patients in the hospital, put somebody on maintenance fluids. What are we maintaining with salt water? Do you know how many grams of salt are in every one liter of normal saline? How many grams? It's given away by the name, but I won't fault you if you've never thought to sink or, or if you've never sat and done the math. Yes, how many grams of salt are in every one liter of normal saline? Don't you answer? I know you know the answer. Brock, how many how many grams of salt are in every one liter of normal saline? Nine? Nine grams of salt in every liter of normal saline. Holy cow. That's like taking somebody to the Chinese, Chinese food buffet down the street every couple hours. What do we advocate people eat grams of salt per day? Not, certainly not nine, and certainly not 18, and certainly not 27. But that's how many liters of salt water you're giving your patient a day when you run saline continuously. Think about it. You default to putting somebody on 100 cc's an hour of saline, and that's a conservative number. Most patients in the hospital on the wards are in a lot more. 100 cc's per hour over 24 hours is 2.4 liters. 2.4 times 9 is 20-some-odd 20 20 -some grams of salt. 
You think you're doing your patient any favors? Dr. Cohen is in charge of the code committee and has done some incredible things, and we've been reviewing our incidents of rapid response in the hospital, and he and I will attest. Do you know what the most common cause of rapid response is in the hospital? Iatrogenic hypervolemia, iatrogenic saltwater drowning. You have dripped in so many liters of salt water that your patient is literally drowning. That's not doing no harm, is it? There's no role for maintenance fluids, ever. I've never had to do it, and I had the sickest patients in the hospital. Questions about maintenance fluids? Are you kind of amazed as you learn this, that all of the patients you saw as a medical student were probably sitting there getting salt water dripped into their vein? There's nothing physiologic about salt water. The pH is low, then they've got a process that's making it even lower, you are making them significantly worse. Sometimes the best thing you can do for your patient is absolutely nothing. It's a whole lot of nothing. It's to hurry up and stand there. And when it comes to maintenance fluids, that is as true as can be. You ever seen anything get better with maintenance fluids? Yeah. All right. Contraindication to fluid bolus. The only time we wouldn't want to give somebody a fluid bolus in shock, because you will oftentimes, if you ever say, fluid bolus for shock, some mustachioed elderly gentleman in the back will say, well, actually, only 50% of shock is fluid responsive. And I hear that and I go, you mean the most dangerous, deadly thing I take care of in the hospital, I can make 50% of them better, one out of every two by giving them a fluid bolus? Sign me up for that medicine because I don't know any other medicine that makes that big of a difference, right? But there are, are times where you should not give a fluid bolus, and that's when the pump has failed because of a contractility problem. Now, I already told you that I don't expect you to figure out exactly what's going on with the heart. Nobody does just yet. But if your IVC is big and dilated, and it's not moving at all, they may very well be a contraindication to fluids. Reevaluate what, whether you're going to do that. Now, I'm not saying you never give fluids to somebody with a dilated IVC. But if you see a dilated IVC, I may not give that whole 30 cc's per kilo. Maybe I'll start with a fluid challenge instead of a fluid bolus. So to review, with fluids, we look for a contraindication. We use our physical exam and vital signs to identify the shock profile, and we ask ourselves, is there a contraindication to giving fluids? If the answer is no, we give a bolus of 30 cc's to a max of three liters of lactated ringers. That's pretty easy, right? That's pretty easy. Hemoglobin. There's no magic hemoglobin number. I wish there was, but there's not. Where do we come up with seven? because it's lucky maybe, I don't know. Chances are, um, and this may just be a rumor or wives' tale or whatever, but, um, or old husband's tale, I guess. Um, back in the day in the 50s, some college took these, or medical school took these healthy college-age males, and they bled them a unit of blood, and then they gave them a liter of lactated ringers, and then they put, they put a swan in them as well, and they measured SVO2 and lactates. And they found that these healthy young men started to make their, their SVO2 dropped below 50%, and they started to make lactate around a hemoglobin of 5. So why did we choose 7 for the big trials? I don't know. Maybe we just assume that sicker people need more hemoglobin. By and large, we are learning that less is more. Giving somebody a blood transfusion is the equivalent of a liquid tissue transplant. It completely suppresses the immune system. Am I, what time? 11.30? completely suppresses the immune system, so when it comes to blood, less is more. Guess what? If somebody has a hemoglobin of 6.8 and they're not in shock, don't give them blood because that is just laboratory variability, and it, they could have very well have been 7.2, in which case you wouldn't have even thought to give them blood. Remember, every time you give blood, it's liquid tissue transplant. And what does transplant do to your immune system? Right in the kisser, right? Really takes it out. So a hemoglobin of seven is probably enough. Now, here's the problem. If you're resuscitating hemorrhagic shock, you don't really care what the hemoglobin is because hemoglobin is a concentration and we bleed whole blood. 
So when I've got somebody in hemorrhagic shock, I am not targeting a hemoglobin in the first six hours. I am targeting hemodynamic stability. I am resuscitating their hemodynamics to get their map up. I'm reversing that coagulopathy, but for everybody else, a hemoglobin of seven is enough, okay? An interesting little tidbit, have any of you people spent time in the ICU yet? Just one, two, three, four, a couple more. What do you notice about the hemoglobin by ICU day three, four, and beyond? What do you notice? It's low. Every patient in the ICU ends up anemic, right? And once they're anemic, what do they get? They get iron studies. Well, the iron didn't give us the answer, so we better check a B12 and folate, and all of that costs money and is worthless in the ICU. Because what does every liter of salt water do to your hemoglobin concentration? It decreases it. It decreases it by one at 24 hours. It decreases it by three at 72 hours. And we're giving everybody a minimum when we start of probably about two to three liters. So if you come in even normal and we're giving you fluid boluses, in addition to, do you know the average fluid amount that ICU patients get per day in the form of drips, antibiotics, pressors, et cetera, flushes? Do you know? Guess. Nailed it. Fist bump. Virtual fist bump because COVID, right? Three liters a day. Oh my gosh, not one, not two, but three. So think twice before you give anybody blood, especially if you're giving them maintenance fluids as well. Big picture, if they're bleeding, resuscitate their hemodynamics. They need blood products. Reverse their coagulopathy. For, most, for almost everybody else, seven is okay. And then finally, vasopressors. I made this table myself. You can tell because it says what it does to the pipes and the pump. And I'm not going to go through every single one of these, except to say that norepinephrine is your go-to presser no matter what. No matter the type of shock, norepinephrine is your go-to presser. You started at 0.05 mics per kilo per minute. I know. I'm not excited about the weight-based dosing either. Nevertheless, we persist, right? We, we use norepi as our first line for all causes of shock because it clamps the pipes and helps squeeze the pump. Vasopressin is our second line. It helps squeeze the pipes. We use a fixed dose most of the time, but sometimes we titrate it down. Epi is our third line. That's our third presser that we use. Phenylephrine is not great. But it's okay if they've got an atrial arrhythmia or they're super tacky and you know that the heart's or the pump is not the problem. That's the only time we're using phenylephrine. Sometimes I'll cheat and we have phenyl or neo sticks. That's a push dose presser. And when we're putting an airway in somebody, we'll give a couple bumps of that because positive pressure decreases your preload, decreases your MAP, giving a sedative causes what's called sympatholysis. It takes away the sympathetic nervous system. And then dopamine, we don't use it. Why don't we tend to use dopamine? Because we have randomized controlled trial that tells us that dopamine is arrhythmogenic, that it's not, that it's inferior to norepi. Just because we don't use dopamine as a first line presser doesn't mean that it is bad or wrong. So we still frequently, despite the fact that this trial was done, was it 18 years ago? 18 years ago, we know that norepi is superior. We, a lot of our transfers from outside hospitals will come in on a dopamine drip. That doesn't mean that that doctor was dumb or less. Because all of this, if you think about it, is just rocket fuel. It's just rocket fuel. And let's not quibble over whether or not we picked one that was different than the one that you would have picked. Did they do the right thing by putting their patient on rocket fuel when they needed rocket fuel? That's probably enough. Right? So if your patient needs rocket fuel, put them on rocket fuel and put them on early. When I'm resuscitating a shock patient and I'm giving my 30 cc's per kilo of LR up to a max of three liters, after that first liter is done, if my map is still less than 65, I'm starting vasopressors simultaneously. And I would argue that I have good evidence-based data to, to support that in the form of the sensor trial. 
Your goal in resuscitating the, the hemodynamics is to getting your MAP over 65. Use rocket fuel early. This is how we are going to use rocket fuel in our hospital, starting in the ED, starting on the floors, all the way up to when they leave. We start norepi at 0.05 mics per kilo per minute, and we titrate it up by 0.05 mics per kilo per minute every two to five minutes. Start norepi at 0.05, and you titrate by 0.05 every few minutes. When that norepi hits 0.3, you will give them two things. Stress corticosteroids, hydrocortisone 50 milligrams every six hours. Not 100 Q8, not because 100 Q8 is wrong, but just because this is how all the studies did it, and we want practice uniformity. We want check the box. We all do it the same way. 50 Q6, and we start vasopressin at 0.04 units per minute. So we start norepi. That goes up. When it hits 0.3, we know exactly what to do. We start vasopressin. We start hydrocortisone. By the time norepi hits 0.5, we need to be sweating. This is considered vasopressor refractory shock, and it's a coin flip about whether or not they're going to make it. This is when we start epinephrine. We start epinephrine at 0.05 mics per kilo per minute, and how do we titrate it? The exact same way that we do norepi. Norepi can go all the way up to 1. Epi, we hold at 0.5. This is a Greenbergism. This is not evidence-based medicine, but a Greenbergism is that nobody in the ICU dies without epi, steroids, and doxycycline. Why doxycycline? Because doxycycline covers every weird infection that you never think about. Tick-borne illnesses, tularemia, all of them. The only one it doesn't cover is babesiosis, but we don't see that here. Nobody dies in the ICU without epi, steroids, and doxycycline. I can't tell you how many times that saved me. Now, you put somebody on rocket fuel or vasopressors, at some point they will reach stability. They'll be stably sick as shit, but stability nonetheless. They'll spend anywhere from 12 to 72 hours there. And then they'll start to get better. Their blood pressure will start to go up, and it'll be time to wean those, that rocket fuel, to wean those vasopressors. And we are going to do it the same way every single time, just like a pilot does with their checklist before takeoff. We're going to wean the, the epinephrine all the way to off. Once that epi is off and we're weaning the norepi, when that's less than 0.3, what do we do? We get rid of the vasopressin. We're just walking down that same table that we used. Now, sometimes when you get rid of the vasopressin, the norepi will have to go up again. Now, if that norepi goes above 0.4, put the vasopressin back on and try it again when the, when the norepi is at 0.2. When the norepi is off, the steroids are off within 24 hours. There's no such thing or need for a steroid taper unless you know definitively that they have adrenal insufficiency, which is exceedingly rare. And most of our patients who end up on steroids with shock, which is a lot of them in the medical ICU are on steroids, you do not need to wean them. 24 hours of stability, off. Questions about rocket fuel titration. So that's it. That is how we resuscitate the hemodynamics. We have three tools. We have fluids, we have blood if necessary, and we have vasopressors. All of a sudden, getting the map over 65 feels pretty straightforward, does it not? At least I got one head nod. Thank you. Step four, we resuscitate the microcirculation. How do we get a window into the microcirculation? We look at our CVO2, we look at our lactate, and we look at our capillary refill time. Those are our windows. So we look at our CVO2, we look at our lactate, and we look at our capillary refill time. Because we want our CVO2 over 70, our lactate less than 2, and our capillary refill time less than 3 seconds. If you've achieved that, and you've got a map over 65, your resuscitation is done. Congratulations. Dust your shoulder off. You can relax. But if those are not at goal, then you really have only tools, two tools left 
to resuscitate the microcirculation. Because if we think about our oxygen delivery, we've already taken care of the oxygen. We've already taken care of the fluid. We've already taken care of getting the MAP over 65. The only thing we have left now is augmenting the cardiac output, specifically the contractility, and maybe uh, fill, or topping off the tank. So, if we're not meeting those microcirculatory resuscitation goals, we are going to ask ourselves the question, are they fluid responsive? Maybe we should say fluid tolerant or fluid responsive. I don't really care what you say. What you're really asking is, can I make things better with just a little bit more fluid? Not a bolus, just a little bit more. We have three ways that we can consider assessing for fluid responsiveness. One is pulse pressure variability. Two is IVC ultrasound, and three is using the distal port of our central line to look at a central venous pressure. Pulse pressure variability is best, but just like anything that's the best, it's finicky, right? The best actors demand the most, right? It's finicky. If you look at this tracing, you can see that it is varying up and down. There is much variability. Remember the pulse pressure, the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. If that is varying significantly, over 12%, and I will show you how to monitor this continuously in the ICU. We will show you this. If it's over 12%, that suggests they'll get better with a fluid challenge. But there's three conditions. They must be on mechanical ventilation and you have to turn their tidal volume up. They must be in normal sinus rhythm and they can't have overt RV failure. Dang, that's a lot of conditions. The second option is IVC ultrasound. It's good, but not great. What we're looking for is an IVC that's less than or equal to two centimeters and over 50% variability. This suggests that they may be able to tolerate some more volume. Now, sometimes we don't have a view with our ultrasound, and we don't meet all of the conditions to do pulse pressure variability, so we use CVP. And we're going to target 8 to 12. When you're starting, and are any of you starting in the ICU on Wednesday? Oh, awesome, awesome. I started. My first rotation of residency was in the ICU. And I'm so thankful it was, because I learned so much. And you'll be with him. And he will take care of you. And he has so much incredible wisdom and knowledge to impart. But he does expect you to know this. CVP. This is our last resort, but it's not bad. It's really not bad. CVP doesn't correlate to volume. We know that. This is a famous scatter plot that tells you that at any CVP, they may or may not be fluid responsive. CVP is high, they might still get better with fluids. CVP is low, they might still get better with fluids. CVP is low, they might get worse with fluids. It's a coin flip, that CVP and fluids. And this is from the famous Paul Merrick paper, The Seven Mares, which I, I'm a little skeptical of, now that the whole vitamin C, thymine, steroids hasn't quite panned out quite as much as he let us believe. Nevertheless, CVP is not a good predictor of fluid. We know that. But our question isn't always, am I going to improve the cardiac output with a fluid challenge? The question is, will more fluid save my patient's life? Let's be real pragmatic about things. I'm a pragmatist. Historically, the resuscitation of septic shock went from a whole lot of nothing, where we just gave somebody some antibiotics, a whole lot of pressors, they sat off in the corner while the ED docs took care or looked for STEMIs. And then they went up to the ICU where they got a swan, were put on mechanical ventilation and paralyzed, and almost everybody died. And then came early goal-directed therapy. Did you guys learn about early goal-directed therapy during medical school? So the study came around, Manny Rivers' early goal-directed therapy paper in 2000, where he revolutionized the resuscitation of septic shock, and one of the things he used was CVP. And then a number of years later, when I was still a resident, we had three big trials, the Process, the Promise, and Arise trial that, that randomized patients with septic shock to either this old early goal-directed therapy or to what they called usual care, which was, of course, unusual and different at each place. 
This is from the process trial. This is the one that was done in the United States. This is in the supplementary appendix. What I find so fascinating is that both at zero to six hours and up to 72 hours, it doesn't matter if you use CVP or your physical exam or whatever it is they used, they got the same amount of fluid. This is the PROMISE trial. This is the early goal-directed therapy versus usual care that was done in the UK, Ireland, Scotland, a couple of other places. Look, there's no difference between using CVP and your other tools when it comes to loading fluid. And this is the ARISE trial, which Australia, in my opinion, has probably become the best ICU care in the world. And look, part of their early goal-directed therapy was resuscitating with fluids to a CVP of eight. There was no meaningful difference in the amount of fluids that they gave. So as you are learning how to do point-of-care ultrasound, as you are learning how to do pulse pressure variability interpretation, CVP is not a bad place to start. And pragmatically, it will lead you to the same end point. It's not sexy, but it sure gets the job done, doesn't it? Do you guys know who this is? Do you people know who this is? Good. All right. So we've already given the fluid bolus, and we said that nobody in the history of ever should get a second fluid bolus. After you give that fluid bolus, now you give a fluid challenge. A fluid challenge is 500 cc's of LR. So you've assessed, it, you've assessed your microcirculatory resuscitation goals. They're not there. You assess for fluid responsiveness. You see fluid responsiveness. You give a 500 cc fluid bolus. And then what do you do? You go back and you do this entire thing over again. You reassess your microcirculation. You ask if I've got fluid responsiveness. And if you still do, you give another fluid bolus. Now, one of my favorite markers of whether or not they're fluid responsive is if I give a 500 cc LR bolus and I see my norepi drop by 0 0.05 or more and stay there, that is a pretty good marker of fluid responsiveness to me. So you keep doing that until it's not working anymore. If you're at four to five liters of fluid resuscitation, question whether or not they truly have fluid responsiveness. Rarely do you need more than that. Now, you've given, you've done your fluid responsiveness test. There's no signs of fluid responsiveness. You've only got one option left, and that's an inotrope. And that's asking the heart to beat harder and faster. We're going to use one. We're going to use dobutamine. That's going to be our inotrope du jour. And we're going to use one of two doses, either 2.5 or 5. You never need to go higher than that. Now, some people like other inotropes. This hospital loves milrinone. I've never seen a hospital more in love with milrinone. Somebody must be getting money from milrinone under the table. I'm just kidding. The reason that we love milrinone at this hospital, I don't personally love it, but some do, is that you can run it through a peripheral IV on the floor. So it's pragmatic that we love milrinone. You can't do it with dopamine, nor should you, in my opinion. But we use one of two doses, either 2.5 or 5. And the reason that I say dobutamine is because it has a half-life in the minutes. The thing about dobutamine is it's not just an inotrope, it's an inodilator. So about a third of patients you put on dopamine, dobutamine, excuse me, will, will, their blood pressure will drop a little bit. Sometimes that's okay, and sometimes it's not okay, and you will be scrambling to resuscitate that blood pressure. That only lasts for a few minutes. Milrinone is a four to six hour challenge. So you put somebody on milrinone and things go south, you got a long time to go before they turn around. So that's why we use dobutamine in the ICU. Step five is early aggressive de-resuscitation. Wiser words have never been spoken. If you're not resuscitating in the ICU, you are de-resuscitating in the ICU. You manipulate the physiology, and then as quickly as possible, you get rid of all of those manipulations. We don't sit around and wait and ever say things like, let's see what they look like tomorrow. Never. 
Because if you're not in the resuscitation stage, you are in the de-resuscitation stage. We are every bit as aggressive with our de-resuscitation as we are with our resuscitation. As you will learn in just a little bit, there is nothing in the world made better by mechanical ventilation. Nothing. But it has a lot of possibility of causing harm. And most of the time, the only way we can get somebody off a ventilator, the most of the time we can undo all the things we did is by de-resuscitating them. So, this is our shock resuscitation. Support the work of breathing with either vapotherm or non-invasive, even if the saturation is reassuring. Find the source using your vital signs, cold or warm, and your point of care ultrasound. Resuscitate the hemodynamics with a fluid bolus, blood, and vasopressors or rocket fuel, resuscitate the microcirculation with a 500 cc fluid challenge or an inotrope and early aggressive de-resuscitation. Now you understand how the circulation works. Now you understand how the circulation fails. And now you know the five steps to saving them. There is nothing more deadly or life-threatening that you will ever encounter in the hospital than shock. And now you know exactly what to do about it.